It looks almost certain John Swinney will be the next leader of this country. So what are his plans and why does he think he is the man to heal a bruised party? I've been speaking to him. The SNP's bruises are nothing compared to the open wounds the Conservatives are licking just now. A calamitous set of results in the English Council elections, capped with the loss of the West Midlands mayoralty last night, gives them plenty to fear from this year's general election. I'll be asking the UK Energy Minister Andrew Bowie if there's anything the Tories can do to turn things round. There were some pretty clear messages for Labour in Thursday's election results too. How deep is the love for Keir Starmer? Well, it depends very much on who you ask. I'll be asking the Scottish Labour leader, Anas Sarwar. So, a party leader, a government minister, and the first minister-elect, perhaps. Quite the line-up this morning. And after all that, it is over to Fiona on the radio and on BBC Sounds. Hi, Fiona. Good morning. Well, it leaves Rishi Sunak naked without a fig leaf. Those are the thoughts of a former Tory minister. On the impact of those local election results, we'll speak to Sir David Liddington, who was to is a maze de facto deputy on what the, he thinks it means for the Conservatives. All that from 10.30. Great, we'll see you then. Thanks very much indeed, Fiona. Right, let's get on with the programme. Yes, good to have you with us this morning. Loads to get into, as there always is at this time on a Sunday morning. And you can have your say on what you're seeing and hearing too. If you want to join the discussion, just use the usual hashtag, that is BBC Sunday Show. Now, officially, the race to find the next SNP leader is still on, but it is a one-horse race just now, and it'll stay that way unless some wild card makes a late run up the rails before lunchtime tomorrow. And more on that in a minute, because it is now not completely impossible, it seems. But this is a big moment for a party struggling to agree a clear direction just now. The new leader will have factions to unite, tempers to calm, perhaps a new policy flat platform to lay out. So how does John Swinney plan to do all that? I spoke to him just before we came on here. John Swinney, um, we've been talking all week about a coronation happening, you being crowned as the new SNP leader and first minister. We're hearing, though, overnight, uh, a well-known activist by the name of Graham McCormick is telling people that he's got the numbers to run against you and he intends to lodge papers. We asked him to confirm that last night. He wouldn't speak to us. But, but do you believe you may now face a contest? Obviously, the party's got internal democracy that it's got to go through and nominations close at noon tomorrow. We will find out tomorrow if there are uh, any more candidates than me contesting the election to be the next SNP leader. But of course, it's the democratic right of members of the party to come forward. There are thresholds of support they have to pass. And if that's the case, then we'll have a contest and we'll know the outcome in a few weeks' time. Would you relish three weeks of hustings around the country? Uh, well, obviously, I'm a participant in party internal democracy. So if that's what the party wishes to have, then that's what we'll have. I think it would be better if we just got on with things, that we started the rebuilding of the SNP and its political strength. I feel the response to my message on Thursday has been very positive within the party and within the country. People in the SNP like my message of bringing the party together, uniting for the SNP and for independence and bringing the country together. And I think the overwhelming majority of party members want to get on with it. And of course, I've now assembled very comprehensive support within the Scottish National Party. And I particularly welcome the endorsement of my campaign that's come from my colleague and friend, Kate Forbes. As you've said, you're positioning yourself as the unity candidate. What was the cause of the disunity in the SNP? I think we had a very difficult leadership election last year. Uh, we obviously had a lot of strains around about a number of issues within Parliament. And I think we've basically just had a pretty rough couple of years. And it's a whole host of issues that have come together. And my route to solve that is, first of all, by bringing people together behind myself as a trusted individual within the SNP, somebody who is held with confidence amongst members of the party who's got a proven track record of bringing people together. Secondly, about making sure that we've got good internal processes of discussion so that members of the party are able to air their points of view in a respectful fashion. And I'll make sure that's the case. I've got, again, in my long history in the SNP, I've got a track record of running our democratic institutions in an effective and appropriate way so that people can have their say. But most importantly, about getting the SNP to face outwards, to engage with the people of Scotland. And I've been 
really overwhelmed by the messages that I've had from colleagues who've been out campaigning over the weekend in Scotland, saying that the public are responding really positively to the mood and the outlook that I've created since Thursday morning when I announced my candidacy. And I think... What, why has the party not um, been engaging we, with the people of Scotland? Well, the party has been engaging, but we've been also, frankly, we've not been as cohesive as we should have been, Martin. And that's been obvious to the public. You can't keep things from the public. The SNP's not looked cohesive. It's not looked together. So the central point of my message is we've got to get ourselves together. We've got to become cohesive again. And I think I've got some of the unique strengths and capabilities to do that, given all that I've done for the SNP and for Scotland over the years. I've brought people together, I've delivered improvements in budgets in a minority government situation, I've been able to bring the party together and to, but to become a much stronger institution that's won electoral success. When I got involved in politics, the SNP was a fringe party. It's been the party of government in Scotland now for 17 years, and I've played my part in building that up. Indeed. So I think the SNP's just got to... Re we've got to realise that we're in a difficult spot. We've got to start the recovery, and I think I am in place to... to best place to do that, and I'd like to get on with that on Monday. Well, if you look at opinion polling, the public believe that your government has failed on all the key areas at the moment. The polling suggests they think you failed on education, on the economy on health, and as you say, you have been in the room for, you know, almost all of living memory, it seems, uh, politically. Your fingerprints are all over those failures, aren't they? I, I wouldn't accept your characterisation, Martin, of where we are. Uh, well, let's that, but just that's what the polling... I've got things. the figures in front well, of me. The polling well, suggests well, negative well, well, approval well, rates on all of those. Let's... I think, that's, I think that's all about just how the SNP is perceived just now generally. Let's go into some of the specifics. So on education, for example, we're now in a situation where the largest proportion of young people are leaving education and going into either university, college or training, what's described as positive destinations. On health, we've got the best performing accident and emergency system in the United Kingdom, although I accept it's got many challenges. We are seeing uh, huge support for the uh, proposals we've put out in relation to the use of tra our travel networks and transport networks. We've got uh, unemployment, which is very, very low as a consequence of the direction of investment in skills and training from the Scottish National Party government. So I think the substance of the SNP's performance is very good and very strong. But what we need to do is we need to share that and express that to the public in a confident way and overcome some of that perception that you've put to me from the polls. Okay, and I um, think that perception comes from the fact that the SNP doesn't look like a cohesive political party just now. Look, I mean, look, we could get dragged into discussions on all of those fields. I don't want to do that because I want to talk about you and your, your specific suitability for this job. Did, did you have to be persuaded to run? Yes, because I, I took a decision last year that I'd been served in government for 16 years. I felt it was time for, uh, for me to give other people a chance to, 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 to take leading roles within the SNP and the government. I felt I'd, frankly, done my bit. I also was mindful of the fact that I'd asked a lot of my family over many years. You know my own personal circumstances. My wife has multiple sclerosis. I'm very heavily involved in supporting her, as I should be and I want to be as her husband. So the idea of me becoming SNP leader and First Minister is not something I can just snap my fingers and say, yeah, let's get on and do that. I had a lot to think about because I've got to think about the implications for my family. And I also had to think about whether this was right for the SNP. Now, if, I, if I'd stood last year, I would have been going into office, and I probably would have won last year, I would have been going into office pretty tired and pretty mentally and physically drained by 16 years in office. I've had a year out of frontline politics. I am physically and mentally rested and my family are confident that we can manage our way through this if I become the First Minister. So I have peace of mind that this is the right thing for, for me to do for me and my family, but also it's the right thing to do for my party and my country. You're obviously very conscious of your responsibilities at home as a husband and a father. You've just spoken about that. Are you confident that you can manage both of those? You can keep up your commitments adequately on both sides? Yes, we'll have to make adjustments in our own home and we're ready to do that. We've, 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 we've taken decisions about that and how we'll go about that. So, yes, I'm confident of that ability. Uh, my family are 
hugely supportive and want me to do this. Uh, they think it's the right thing for, for me and for my party and for Scotland. So I should go on and do it. I don't want to, I don't want to and I don't think they want to have uh, what ifs in their lives or in my life. So we, we're ready to do that. Uh, I feel physically and mentally ready to become the leader of the SNP and the First Minister of Scotland. And I will give it absolutely everything I have in me to make sure that my party succeeds and my country succeeds. All right, well, let's talk about direction. You've said that you want to return the SNP to governing from the mainstream. You said your goals include the pursuit of economic growth. If we move to net zero, we need to take people and businesses with us. They're all messages that are going to strike a certain amount of um, fear into the hearts of your former colleagues in the Green Party, whose votes, one would imagine, you will still need if you're to get budgets and big policies through. How are you going to manage all that? Well, how we're going to manage it is by engaging in courteous and respectful dialogue within the Parliament. And uh, I, I've set out, as you fairly represent in your question, Martin, the direction of travel I want the SNP to take forward. I believe in mainstream politics. I believe the SNP should pursue a moderate left of centre policy programme. That is where I come from politically and I want to make sure that is successful. So we, we will bring these proposals forward to Parliament and work with others to advance those proposals. Now, Do you think you can get agreements obligation. with anybody other than the Greens? I, I think we probably can do. Uh, I saw it just the other week there, for example, the government was taking forward legislation about keeping the promise, about making sure that we deliver for children who've experience of care. And I saw our uh, minister, Natalie Dawn, who was taking that bill through, reach agreements with, for example, um, Labour and Liberal Democrat members about the uh, amendments to that bill. She'd worked very hard to make sure that she got into a good position. But they're not going to pass like a budget for you, are they? Well, I don't see why we should rule that out, uh, Martin. In the past, I had Liberal Democrat, Labour, Conservative, Green support for budgets. I also had support from my dear late colleague, Margot MacDonald. So but that's a I, different I parliament, should, Mr Swinney. Yeah, it's so much more think... attritious now in that parliament with, with all that's happened, and especially over the constitution. There is a belief within those parties, I think, or a conviction within those parties that they won't work with a pro-independence party and they won't pass those budgets. Do, do you think differently? Well, bluntly, if that's their view, that's their problem. But that won't pay teachers. It won't pay nurses. It won't make sure we can get op operations done in our hospitals because if you don't pass a budget, you can't fund your public services. So there becomes a responsibility, Martin, on all of us. Now, if we go back to 2009, when one of my budgets didn't get through Parliament on the first time of asking, um, within a week, the, or maybe a couple of weeks, the budget was passed virtually in its entirety from what I'd originally proposed because the opposition parties were challenged about how hospitals were going to be funded or schools were going to be funded or councils were going to be funded and they didn't have any answers. So a budget process puts a responsibility and an obligation on everybody, not just the government. I accept that government's got to act differently to try to get people on board. Government's got to change how it talks to people. But the example I've just given you about uh, the children's bill the other week there and the conduct of our minister, Natalie Dawn, she was able to get people into a point of agreement. We've got to do more of that in the period going forward. Okay. That'll be a test for the government, but it'll also be a test for the opposition too. Let me just ask you, Hamza Youssef, in his departure speech, said Scotland is, quote, frustratingly close to independence and I'm absolutely certain my successor will deliver it. Are you absolutely certain you will be the man to deliver independence, John Swinney? I am, yes. How are you going to do that? I'm going to do it by reaching out to people in Scotland and explaining the reasons why Scotland has got to be an independent country. And let me just give you two examples of that. The first is that every household in this country is struggling with the cost of living crisis that we are all facing. That is a product of 14 years of austerity and economic mismanage by, uh, mismanagement by the United Kingdom government, especially the madness of the Liz Trust government, which the Scottish Conservatives wanted me to follow. The second thing is that we're suffering because of a Tory-imposed Brexit that we in Scotland never voted for. Now, the way to avoid these crises of the cost of living crisis or the Brexit crisis is for Scotland to be able to take her own decisions. How but much support for that, that argument do you need, Mr Swinney, before you can ask for a referendum again? 60% polling? Really. 
really convincing and demonstrable increased levels of support for independence. Now, independence what, 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 give me a figure. More give me a figure, John Swinney. Well, I, I'm not. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into this. Sixty percent. Kind of, you know, I'm in the. Er I'm in the early days, Martin. Let's let's just let's just quietly and patiently go through this discussion because I want to have I want to have a dialogue with the public in Scotland. I want to build their confidence around independence. Now, independence is better supported today than it was in 2014. So that's an optimistic point. But I think we've still got a lot of work to do to bring people to share the arguments and the aspirations that I have felt all my adult life. And I want to make sure I win that argument, but I'll do it by patient and respectful dialogue with people in Scotland. We need more of that. We've got far too much of the attrition and the conflict in political debate. I want to take some of the conflict out of it and have a reasoned conversation. All right, we'll be having many more conversations, I'm sure, in the months to come. But for now, John Swinney, thank you very much indeed for being with us on The Sunday Show. Thank you. Well, if you want to be the person putting the questions to the politicians, you can. Just join Stephen Jardin on Debate Night. A week's a long time in politics, especially in Scotland at the moment. This Wednesday, we will be in Cumbernauld with a panel of politicians and an audience of voters. If you want to come along and join them, details are on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night. And make sure you watch Wednesday, 10.30 on the BBC Scotland channel. Yeah, do join Stephen if you can. Now, it was the Scottish Conservatives, of course, who brought down the last First Minister. They proposed a motion of no confidence in Humza Yousaf, remember, and rather than fight it and lose, he resigned. But if the SNP have problems just now, they are nothing compared to a Tory party who lost almost 500 local councillors in a local election drubbing in England on Thursday and capped it all off with the loss of the West Midlands mayoralty. Andy Street ousted last night. So what, if anything, can they do to cling on to power? Andrew Bowie is the MP for Aberdeenshire and Kincardine and a UK energy minister. He joins me now from our studio in Aberdeen. Good morning, Mr Bowie. Morning, Martin. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to what John Swinney said. Very robust, very optimistic. Did you miscalculate by taking uh, Humza Yusuf's scalp? Is he a better uh, opponent? No, I think it was for the betterment of Scotland that Humza Yusuf is no longer uh, our First Minister. He was running a chaotic government that had lost all sense of direction and indeed purpose and was completely disconnected from the wishes of the or the priorities of the people of Scotland. So now we have uh, John Swinney, seemingly the next First Minister of Scotland, although that process is still yet to complete its course. If the, the idea that John Swinney is uh, tomorrow's man is frankly laughable given that he was last leader of the SNP when Bill Clinton was Prime Minister, Bob the Builder was number one and I was 12 years old. So if he's tomorrow's man and he's all that the SNP can offer, then frankly, I think they're in a dreadful situation and, and Scotland, frankly, deserves better. Do you think they'll be are... stronger under him now? Uh, look, no, I, I think it's quite clear. I mean, John Swinney's priority, as was Nicola Sturgeon's priority, Alex Salmond and Humza Yousaf's, is to uh, rip Scotland out of the United Kingdom. That is not the priority of the Scottish people. They want to see a Scottish government focusing on improving the healthcare situation, improving education standards, improving transport across Scotland. They don't want another divisive referendum on independence. But John Swinney stood on a platform of John well, Swinney Well, almost half of them do want independence, Mr Bowie. Let's not yes, overlook that. Yeah, but Martin, even if you look at those people that do want independence eventually, it's not in their top priorities of what the Scottish government should be focusing on right now. So for John Swinney to run on a platform of unite for independence, not unite for Scotland or unite for better health care or unite for better transport, but unite for, for independence just shows exactly where his priorities lie okay. and where the priorities of the SNP will always lie. Well, I'll tell you what one of his priorities is because he's been laying out just a very kind of early uh, couple of, um, of policy thoughts. He wants to do something on immigration to offset the really damaging impact of Brexit on Scotland and who wants perhaps to ask for new immigration rules here. Do you think the UK government would ever work with him on that or grant that? Look, we will work with the Scottish government and we, we do work very uh, collaboratively and constructively with the Scottish government on a whole host of different issues. But immigration is as roundly uh, uh, agreed as is actually at its highest point in many years. And we're doing what we can to stem uh, the tide of illegal immigration across the channel and indeed get to grips with high levels of legal well, He's not talking about that, Mr Bowie. And as, as you well know, in, in certain sectors in Scotland, they, they're desperate for more staff and we have an ageing population. We need more inward migration to stave off long-term problems. You must accept, I mean, every economist will tell you that. Would you work with them on a separate system for Scotland to help that? 
Uh, look, we will do what we need to to support those sectors that are looking for additional workers, as we have done with seasonal agriculture worker scheme, as we're looking to do uh, with the fishing sector. But one of the things the SNP won't tell you is that even under freedom of movement, when we were in the EU, Scotland was the only part of the United Kingdom to have a declining population. So there is obviously something about Scotland, Scotland's economy and the way that the SNP have been running Scotland for the last decade and more that's preventing people from coming to Scotland to making a life for themselves there. Possibly the fact that Scotland is now the highest tax part of the United Kingdom if you earn over £28,000. So maybe they should start looking at what they okay. can do to grow the economy and make Scotland a more investable destination, a destination where people want to come and right. grow their lives, raise their families and invest. And if they do that, we might be able to start to address some of the issues that these sectors are seeing. Let's look at your problems, because they are many and varied. Given the electoral bloodbath in England last week, um, when do you think the general election will be? <laughs> Look, I mean, that's entirely in the gift of the Prime Minister. That's not what I'm focused on. I'm focused on listening to what the people are saying in the country. And that, frankly, is that they've had enough of the game playing and the, the Westminster merry-go-round. They want the government to get on and focus on their priorities. They've had enough the of economy. your party, is what they were saying loud and clear, isn't it? Well, I don't know, um, well, Martin. If you look at the BBC's... What, what other uh, possible national... interpretation could you have at the loss of half of your council seats? Look, hey, make no bones about it. Thursday was a very difficult day for the Conservative Party. I was d uh, very disappointed to see, for example, Andy Street, who's been a fantastic mayor in the West Midlands, lose his position uh, championing Birmingham and uh, the surrounding area uh, on Thursday. But the fact is that it's now up to us uh, to listen to what the people are saying, to start getting down to work and stop focusing on the game playing, doing what the Prime Minister says, sticking to the plan, growing the economy, calving inflation, cutting debt, dealing with the boats and ensuring that our NHS is fit for the future. That that's, is what this government is focused on. And that's that is quite what the people list. will reward us for when the, the election comes, whenever that is. Right, so, so Rishi Sunak is an election winning machine, is he? Look, Rishi Sunak is the Prime Minister and he's got my full support and confidence as we move forward over the next few months taking action on the people's priorities and then, of course, heading to the country in a general election whenever he decides that might be. What's the mood like in your party just now, Mr Bay? I mean, it's in real trouble. Let's just cut to the chase. Obviously, we were disappointed at the results on Thursday. Some very good uh, local champions across the country, councillors, friends of mine, uh, lost their jobs. Uh, but the mood within the party is one of determination, uh, one of focus one that realises that we have got a job to do to convince the, the British public to, to award us with a, a fifth historic... Uh, Are you running out of time to turn this round? Uh, look, uh, look th that will be for the British people to decide. We are only focused on getting on with the job, improving the economy of the country, improving this country and making it sure that it is fit for the future. Summer election out of the question, one word? I mean, that is entirely up to the Prime Minister. All right. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Andrew Bowie. Thank you. thank you for your input this morning. Well, listening to all of that beside me in the studio is the Scottish Labour leader, Anna Sawar. Morning. Good morning, Mark. Um, do you think that it was a strategic mistake in retrospect getting rid of Hamza Yusuf? Uh, look, no. I mean, it's for the SNP internally to decide uh, whether it was the right thing for them to pressure him to do what he did and everything that happened afterwards. I think the main thing here, though, is John Swinney is not less trust, I'll give him that, but he is more Rishi Sunak. I think underneath uh, this veneer, there is still a deeply chaotic and divided political party that I think has broken its trust with the Scottish people. And all of this is about managing his political party rather than running the country. I didn't hear anything from John Swinney around any new direction to, for example, fix our NHS, to get our well, education system time. back on track. Uh, give him time. This is a man that's been at the heart of government for 17 years. No, sure. Years. But, hey, listen, he's not, yeah, taking, so, so he's the, not taking control So the, yet, idea, the idea that we should just hang back and give the man time this is the man that finance secretary broke the public finance. Let me ask you this. As education secretary destroyed our education system and now we need to give them time. Frankly, I think Scots have seen past it and the only thing they want is an election so we can get some change. Look at, well, in that election, a lot of the time, there's, there's a poll in the Sunday Times that says you will do very well in that election, but a lot of the seats that you're targeting to take away from them are wafer thin. He doesn't need to rise support in the SNP by much, three, four, five percent, and he could take half of them back. That's an issue, isn't it? So I think you raise a really serious point, which is John Swinney's job is to manage his party and manage the decline rather than actually focus on the priorities facing people here in Scotland. We have an NHS where almost one in six Scots are stuck on an NHS waiting list, almost 50%. 
of the hip and knee replacements that happen in our country are happening privately because of the long waits. You didn't hear any of that from John Sweeney. Instead, you heard it's a perception because we're not a cohesive political party. It is head in the sand stuff. This is a political party that has lost that link that it had for a very long time with people across Scotland. They're deeply frustrated. They don't think their eyes are on the issues that really matter to them. And it's all just about performance and managing the party, not, as I say, about running our country, which is facing huge challenges, but has abundance of potential. And I want to unleash that potential. There's no Scotland. deep love for your party, though, either. The Tories are hemorrhaging votes. You're not putting a huge amount on. It's way for thin, this, isn't it? I mean, your big selling point is you're not the Tories. <laughs> all, all, I would, all, I you're not the all I would say on that, all I would say on that, Martin, is three years ago, when I became leader of my party, three years ago when John Smith is about to now become leader of his party, I was 32 points behind the SNP. The poll you referenced today has us five points ahead of the SNP. I was up against a first minister that had an approval rating of plus 52. We have just about to, we're just about to lose a first minister with an approval rating of minus okay. 47. So no one can look at the Labour Party and can't say it hasn't changed can't say it's not focused on the people's priority and can't say we aren't well, rebuilding. I tell That's you what the you... contrast now. We are in rebuilding mode, earning people's trust, earning their support, still a lot more work to do. The SNP are managing the decline, both of their party, well, are you? even more fundamentally are the you? country. Because there's a thought that actually you're not really showing anything at the moment. People don't know what you're all about. There's certainly a big issue for you on Gaza in Oldham. That was demonstrated. Big pushback south of the border that you're not taking a strong priority or strong focus on that. Uh, can, you're can, you're can much stronger on, on Gaza. Can, Should Keir Starmer fall into line with your position on Gaza? Well, well, Keir Starmer's position is the exact same as my position. We want an immediate ceasefire. We want the immediate release of hostages. So why is that we so want immediate access and to toxically unpopular aid. among and we the want communities? A, and we England. want a two-state solution so the people of Israel and Palestine. So why are you hemorrhaging votes on it in England? I, I George think Galloway's threatening to unseat Angela Rayner over this issue. Well, I think Angela will be completely fine, and she's going to lead that new deal for working people. You say no ideas, a new deal for working people that is the biggest transformative change in workers' rights in a generation that will end exploitative zero-hour contracts, that will end the scandal of fire and rehire, that will deliver a real living wage for people right across our country, lifting people out of poverty while also increasing tax receipts that can go back into investing in our public services. That's just one example of the change you get with Labour. But closer to home, here in Scotland, we have an NHS that is declining on the SNP's watch. We have already set out ambitious plans, for example, around how we reduce the management layer of our NHS, put more money into frontline services, how we have a proper workforce plan so we can invest in local practices and GPs. People can't access GPs right now, as well as investing in, for example, okay. mental health, which is there is a We're ticking in... time bomb for young people. These are the big issues okay. that John Swinney and the SNP should be talking about. Let me ask you about but a big instead issue. they're talking about managing Let the Let me ask you a party. big issue for a big section of, of our audience this morning, the WASPy women. There was a motion in Parliament last week to fully compensate them for historic injustices. You abstained. Why? So we actually add, tried to add to the motion. We didn't try to change any words in the SNP motion. But you have said you didn't give any votes. So that really, but it's important to recognise why. If you look at our amendment, it was to say that we have to fix a lot of the mess of the Conservatives, the infected blood scandal being one example. Depend it's a question of priorities. Depend you can make them your priority or not. No, look, absolutely it's a question of priorities, but there also is a reflection of the fact that we have economic carnage under this Conservative Party and we will have a 14-year mess to fix. And I would much prefer that you had a Labour Party saying we're only going to make promises we can keep, we're only going to make a commitment if we know where that money's going to come from. So absolutely justice for the uh, Waspy women, of course they deserve an apology, but they also deserve compensation. But we are going to do it in a proper way that is managing the finances so we don't have a repeat of Liz Truss, her budget, and an economic carnage that meant mortgages going through the roof. We're going to do it in a responsible way that is about standing up and fixing the mess of the Conservatives, but also building a stronger country in the process. All right. Anasawa, we are completely out of time. Thank you very much My pleasure. for coming in and speaking to us on the Sunday show this morning.